Can everyone hear me? This is Victoria. Can anybody hear me? We sure can. We're about to get started. Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for the fourth webinar in the ROSC Data Dashboard series. Today, we'll be focusing on using data for program improvement. Now, you may remember us from previous webinars, but by way of introduction, uh, you've already met Lauren from Apt Associates, who's going to be helping us keep all of the technology working smoothly today. Jennifer from Apt Associates will be helping with Q&A, and I'm Nathan, also from Apt. Now, today, we're going to start with a quick review of the purpose of the data dashboard. We're going to discuss ROS and COVID-19, and then we'll dive into using data for program improvement. At the end, we'll have time for any questions that haven't already been answered, but we encourage you to use the WebEx Q&A feature to ask a question at any time during the webinar, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can throughout as we're talking. I will also add that today's webinar is intended for grantees who have seen at least the first two webinars or are already familiar with the data dashboard. This is not intended to be an intro level webinar. So if you haven't seen the first two webinars, we encourage you to review the recordings of those available on the HUD exchange for some important background for today. We are also today very lucky to have three guest presenters. We have Trey Humans from HUD at the Ross Program Office. He'll be talking about COVID-19 and the Ross Program. And we have Melissa Nordo or from the City of Des Moines Municipal Housing Agency and Victoria Wimberly from the Oakland Housing Authority. And they'll each be speaking about how they've used data for program improvement. Now, as a review, the ROS Data Dashboard visualizes data that ROS grantees like you submit to HUD every year. It shows you how your program is performing based on that data. And the goal of the dashboard is fundamentally to help ROS grantees and the people they serve. To do that, you can see the reach and the progress of your ROS work focused on program priorities like services provided and participant outcomes. You can compare your program's activities and outcomes to those of similar grantees. You can identify where and how you can strengthen your program's performance, including how to better reach participants with more services, how to improve participant outcomes, and how better data submissions can more accurately reflect your performance. As a reminder, the data in the ROS dashboard comes from the annual reports that you already submit to HUD each year. You're not required to do any new data collection or submission to use the dashboard. So with that introduction, I would like to turn it over to Trey to discuss the Ross program and COVID-19. Trey, it's all yours. Thank you, Nathan. And once again, welcome everyone to uh, this webinar. Excited to kick it off and also have um, the perspective of and experience of our Ross coordinators um, on this call. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, we have a poll question um, how has COVID-19 changed how your Ross program serves as participants? Lauren, did you want to give some instructions for the poll? Hey everyone, I'm going to start the poll now. Please take a moment to answer the poll and we'll close it in about a minute. And I'll add that you can select as many of these as apply. You don't need to choose just one. Lauren, should we give it another couple of seconds? Sure thing. Okay. Great. So everyone is doing the poll of how has COVID-19 changed how your ROC program serves as participants? Um, you can select uh, provide fewer services, provide more services, provide different services, or no change. Great, and it looks like the poll has ended. Lauren, do you want to show the results? Great. So um, it looks like we have 
a mix of things going on. So we have about 44 of you guys that uh, said that you're providing fewer services. Um, there are nine that said that you guys are providing more services. Um, 51, uh, which seems to be the most, are providing different services. And um, three said that there's no change. Um, and then 43 of you guys with no answer. So it does seem like there are folks that are either at providing more services, sorry, providing different services or providing fewer services. So I think it's a really good time to talk about that, of how you can think about your Ross program, especially um, during the pandemic and as we're now on the road to recovery um, and hopefully overcoming this pandemic. So we can go to the next slide. So some of the opportunities that we've heard um, and challenges that we heard from our grantees have been, one, very insightful because it's provided a lot of knowledge of what's going on on the ground, and I think it's been super helpful. Um, so as much as you can and sharing that out to us, that's, um, please do so. So there are folks that um, have t let us know that many uh, of their housing authorities have shifted to remote systems for foul enrollments for service coordination. And so many of you guys may be working at home. It has required you to up your technology game and be able to uh, provide either virtual service coordination and doing things probably on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Um, and so that shift has been um, has been a, also a good deal of opportunity for many of our service coordinators. Another one is many programs have expanded their systems or skills for remote engagement. And so that's that virtual, virtual service coordination, also um, buying um, software so you can reach out to different folks through a text message or call, and it can be through an automated system, um, as well as probably having the need to buy more computers for staff or expanding your um, broadband network at your housing authorities or your facilities. Um, another one is used outreach. Uh, coordinators, they use even, for example, as of recent COVID vaccine vaccination. So the sign up of that happening through a Ross coordinator um, but that is an opportunity for that Ross coordinator to meet folks that they have not met before um, and build relationships with them. So it's exposed them to a different set of folks, um, whether that be in the or uh, in the virtual world. Uh, some challenges have been uh, for residents significant job loss or lower wages. As we know, the pandemic has really um, you know, impacted the labor market um, and some markets more than others. And so there are residents that are um, experiencing significant job or lower wages. Um, and that could be, the lower wages could be to reduced hours. Um, other challenges are the inability to provide in-home health care for seniors or people with disabilities, right? So because uh, folks were practicing social distancing and may be uh, fearful of having someone come into their apartment to uh, provide any services, uh, you know, those types of services may have been restricted or um, denied. Uh, and so therefore that resident may not have received a service that may have been valuable to them uh, pre-COVID. The inability to meet in person, that is a challenge in how to maintain engagement, right? Uh, there are some of us like myself that really adore meeting people in person, I think is great. Um, and probably you you guys know it. when you're working in service coordination, uh, being a service coordinator, it really helps to see someone face to face and build that trust and build that relationship. Um, and so being in this virtual world and uh, not being able to meet in person can be a challenge. Uh, also PHA operations, so the housing authority or your tribe operations. So uh, you may have shut down or everything is now remote. Um, and having just to adapt to that. Um, and one of the other challenges um, is resident health, internet connectivity, education, and childcare. So how to address all of those 
areas of need um, during this pandemic. So we can go to the next slide. So here's some helpful tips in addressing those opportunities and challenges. So uh, the first one is assessing the needs of families. So one, this is the and the um, purpose of the Ross program, not only to just assess the needs, but also provide and coordinate those services for those residents to address those needs. So making sure that you're still assessing the needs of families. Um, one of the things that we've asked, um, especially during this time, to coordinators that will reach out is, have you assessed the needs of your residents since the pandemic? And um, sometimes I get, yes, 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 we have. And a lot of times I've gotten no. And so how can you really know what you need to work on and how to address it if you don't know how these may have shifted, uh, especially during this pandemic, right? It's impacted us all and priorities may have changed, even though needs may be the same, but uh, where the priority lies may have shifted a bit. So um, when assessing the needs, it definitely, uh, I've talked about uh, shifting the priorities, so that may definitely occur. Um, and as a result of that shift in the priorities, it will then allow um, for you to see how that can either change your service coordination and service delivery model, right? So as you know the needs shifting, you then can make the necessary changes to address those needs of your residents. Um, and I also just wanna note that by merely assessing the needs of a public housing or a tribal resident, you are, uh, they can be considered a participant. Um, so next is communicating regularly with families. And I have a note there of being creative. Uh, and one, I think it's extremely important to find creative ways to be or to communicate with families, especially during this time. Uh, one of the things that we noticed um, probably in our own lives, and I always talk about even my family, my family, we never use Zoom, we never use FaceTime, but it has been remarkable to do that. We also never use group text either, but I can't tell you that I, every other day, my family is always trying to use Zoom, FaceTime, or group message, and it's a way for us to communicate. Um, although we prefer to be in person, right, um, this is a great tool that we now can use to communicate with each other. And so just want to have you guys think about that, which is, you know, even though you may not prefer to communicate in these different ways that we have to now, uh, use the tools that you find um, really helpful and um, that your residents are leaning more towards to communicate to them. Um, one of the things I think is really important is having whoever your partners is or your, uh, you know, who may be providing services, have calls with them so that they can also communicate the same thing that you are communicating, right? So they're reiterating uh, if there's an event happening, if there's some sort of initiative that you guys have going on, that they're also communicating those things. Um, using technology, so I talked about the group text and FaceTime and Zoom, but there's so much more um, apps out there and uh, social media platforms that you guys can use to uh, communicate with your, um, with your, with residents. One of the uh, things I learned at my last job, we had a social media account and we had some Twitter followers and, you know, I always would get upset because I'm like, nobody is liking my post. Um, but it's crazy because even though I'll post about an event that's happening, people will still show up. And one of the things I recognized very early on when that was happening was just because someone didn't like a post uh, doesn't mean that they didn't see it. So I think it's a matter of being consistent, um, especially if you're using your social media, any sort of technology and communicating with families. Um, of course, calls or text, um, but there's um, software or tools that you can use to do automated text messages and text messages and calls. Um, and I know several grantees have, you know, purchased this through their admin funds. So uh, this is another opportunity for you guys uh, to be creative in communicating with your families. And one of the things that I'm, I'm a little old school. 
but I always say it's really helpful when you know who your popular residents are, who always are in the know of what's going on in their community to hold them close and provide them information. And sometimes I'll be honest, I have in the past when working at my last job, I would um, make it seem like I was telling them something exclusive because I knew uh, within hours, they'll be all over the community, right? Oh, we're thinking about doing a, you know, an event around this and that and that and this. And, you know, word would get out and people would be knocking on my door. Um, and that's just because of me being very strategic of also who I was telling. So find out who those people are in your communities that can share um, what you have going on and rally around the uh, initiatives that you may have taken place. And then lastly on the slide, meeting with partners. So discuss, uh, I think one, discussing ways to retrieve information for annual reports is extremely important. And I hear you guys talking about that all the time. And I always wonder, right? Well, how strong is your partnership with uh, these folks that you are calling a partner, right? There are some things that are, are confidential and may not be shared, uh, especially around health things, but um, that doesn't also mean that you can't have this type of information or some information from them. For example, have someone uh, received a uh, Meals on Wheels service this week, um, if there's another partner that's coordinating or providing that service. Uh, so I think it's really important when you meet your, your partners, you can discuss different things, especially uh, ways to retrieve information uh, discussing how you can strengthen your coordination based on the needs of the residents and if there are any service gaps. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so, I want to give some more tips, and this is around tracking your work. So, I know several of you guys are doing uh, different things, as 51 of you guys said. Um, but tracking your work is really, really important, especially during this time. Um, so a lot of folks probably, if you know it or not, have been doing housing retention services, which is if you've been doing any work around eviction prevention, right, uh, which has been really huge during this year with many folks uh, experiencing job loss or change in uh, their income or, or earned income, um, eviction have been, you know, a big topic. And so you may have been doing a lot of work around evictions or may now do a lot of work around, um, you know, after the pandemic, post pandemic, around repayment agreements with landlords or what have you. So, you know, as if you're doing that work with a coordinator, you definitely can track this in your annual reports through the housing retention service um, data element. There's also service coordination. And I just want to note that this is very broad, right? And so if someone is receiving any service coordination, you can select yes um, in this regard. But here's an opportunity for anything that you are doing that is not tracked or data element and the uh, under Roth. So for example, uh, many of you guys have asked, I'm coordinating uh, masks or cleaning products for residents. Um, and obviously that is not something that's under or a data element under the Ross program uh, because it's, you know, it's a new need, right? And not something that we ever thought about, um, but you can use uh, this data element service coordination as a way to uh, say, here's for the other miscellaneous things um, that we've also been coordinating that doesn't fall under any other category um, in, for the data element. Then you have the financial account creation and the financial account creation service. So the financial account creation, that's if an uh, individual has created a banking or a uh, savings account. And with uh, the economic stimulus payments going out, there have been folks that have opened up bank accounts. Um, and so if you've known of that or know of that, this is an opportunity to uh, check with your residents and uh, be able to respond to that data element. And the financial account creation service um, is if they open up a banking or checking or saving, uh, checking or savings account, or if the, even if they didn't open it up, but you were providing any sort of uh, service coordination or support and getting them um, banked, 
then you can also uh, respond to this data element. Then there's the medical care service. So I know of a lot of Ross coordinators that are doing a lot around COVID vaccine, uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, and so medical care service is a very broad definition, uh, but it just means that they're receiving some sort of medical care service, right? And so the COVID vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine can fall in this uh, category. Uh, food and nutrition, many folks are working on the meals for wills and providing weekly or daily meals to uh, residents. So that's another right uh, data element that you can respond to. And work readiness. Um, so I wanted to just point this out because many folks may be working with residents that are working but had to adapt to working from home. And therefore, you've been working on, uh, you know, maybe getting internet connectivity or just getting them equipped to telework. Um, work readiness doesn't always have to be for those that are unemployed. It also can be for those that are employed and getting them ready for any shifts or changes. So if you fall within that category of providing any sort of work readiness for those that are teleworking now, um, you can respond through that data element. Um, there are many more that you can look at and respond to. I think one of the big things here um, and why I'm almost a little bit surprised about the providing fewer services is because I do know a lot of folks have been providing, uh, uh, providing services and it may be concentrated, uh, but I think also a good part of that may be uh, that you're uh, are limiting or narrowing the definitions that are in the Roth data guide for the data elements. And many of them are very broad and they're very broad on purpose. And so hopefully, you know, this talk here has allowed you to see that and may spark some questions um, towards the end. Also, um, for you to send to the Roth mailbox about how you can better track all of the work that you're doing. And the next slide. Um, so, this is my last slide for tips for serving families. So, build equitable programs. One of the things I think is super um, important for you to do is identify if any one or any group is not being served, especially during this time, uh, right? So, I know, for example, we saw re uh, data showing that uh, elders and uh, or seniors and people with disability we're receiving less care um, because of uh, the limitations or restrictions of uh, folks entering into their their apartments or their units. And so, um, you know, is that that family now not being served? And I think it's really important to identify that so you know how to then address whatever needs uh, they may have, considering that you know a service. Um, or a partner is unable to provide that service. Engage with vulnerable population. So during this time, we know that a lot of folks may be unemployed or, you know, may have health issues um, or for those that are experiencing or have, uh, you know, a history of social isolation or depression. This is a really good time to engage those folks um, and keep them, you know, close, especially during this time as well as we know that they're going to be, if not already, some economic impacts. And so being forward thinking of how you're going to address that and um, what cushions you're going to have in place as a Ross program to support those as they go through, you know, through these times. And uh, lastly on this bullet is diversifying your partners and your service providers. One of the things that um, I learned at my last job that was annoying to the people that were receiving services was I always partnered with the same folks all the time. And what I didn't recognize was a whole group of residents that I wasn't reaching, and that was because of my service providers. And I'll give some really good examples. We had a growing um, Dominican population who spoke only Spanish, right? And I, all of my partners did not speak Spanish. And so I had to diversify my partners to really appeal to that uh, those group of people so that they can also be able to communicate clearly and also have that, you know, 
uh, cultural, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, relationship and also um, uh, knowledge of what was going on that I didn't necessarily um, have and so, or the partners have. So I think it's really important that you think about how you're diversifying your partners. And when I also talk about diversifying partners, it doesn't mean just as it relates to race or sexual preference or gender, it also can be as it relates to what types of services they are actually providing. So with that, making sure that you're preventing any service gaps. Uh, so for example, there may be folks that are working on COVID-19 vaccinations, right? Or they're working on eviction prevention. Um, you wanna make sure that you're following through and with all the types of services that are needed to make those types of, um, to make those outcomes great for that, the individuals that you're working with. So I'll use eviction prevention as an example, that if you're working on housing prevention um, uh, or eviction, uh, eviction um, uh, working on mitigating, I guess, evictions for residents, you wanna make sure that uh, you're not only just working on repayment agreements and their income and financial statements, but you also wanna work on any, uh, you know, getting them employed, you know, during this time or getting them signed up for public benefits. And you don't wanna leave any room or gaps for them, especially during this time so that they won't fall behind. Um, involve residents as much as possible. Um, and then the last, shifting your service delivery model, which I've mentioned before, as the needs change, you wanna make sure that you're able to relate to those residents. And the next slide, and I think that's it for me. I'll turn it back to you, Nathan. Thank you, Trey. Um, I think this is a good time to pause for questions. Jennifer, do you see anything in the QA that Trey might be able to respond to before we move on? Yeah, so we do have two questions. One looks like from a new grantee asking if um, uh, we can purchase case management software with grant funding this month, even though our program will not start until June 1st. Yeah, so if you're a new grantee, you would need to wait until June to purchase because uh, you will need to incur the cost from June 1st thereafter. The next question um, is noting that eviction has not been such an issue for, for most families uh, for this grantee who are for, for families who are making more with stimulus than when working. Um, but they're wanting to know, can, can we count all emails regarding employment opportunities as career guidance or service coordination? Um, uh, for example, uh, meals on on wheels um, reporting on number, I think it says reporting on number or time. So um, I would have to quickly look at the Roth data guide. And so maybe I'll ask, um, look at this during the Q&A, uh, look at this so I can revisit this during the QA portion of the webinar. But I wanna say uh, from my memory that the career guidance um, is a little bit more than just sending out emails around employment opportunities. It's really about how you're working with that individual to develop, I guess, a career pathway for them and, and, and give them guidance along the way. So I will say it's a little bit more involved in that. Okay. Um, but I think I also answered the question around service coordination for Meals on Wheels and yes, so anything that is not um, capture it in other data elements, you can capture that through the service coordination data element by selecting yes. Thank you, that's all the questions for now. I think we can move on. All right, thank you. So we are now gonna dive into using data for program improvement. Before we get started with this section, we wanna hear from all of you. In the past, what steps would you typically take to start planning an improvement to your Ross program? can check all that apply here, talking to participants, talking to colleagues, using resources from HUD, looking at data, or something else. And there's not a right or wrong answer here. We're mostly just curious about what approaches grantees uh, have, have taken in the past. So go ahead and check any of these answers that apply to you. We'll leave this open for about a minute, 
and afterwards we'll share the overall results. And this will be anonymous, we won't share your name, just the number of people who've selected each option. Take about a minute to fill this out and then we'll come back. All right, we'll leave a few more seconds and then uh, go over some results. Okay, looks like talking to participants is most common, followed by talking to colleagues. And using resources from HUD and looking at data are pretty close to each other, the next most popular, and a few of you selected something else. So I see a healthy balance across a lot of these, and, and I'm glad to see that uh, a lot of people seem to be using more than one option. But it does seem like talking to participants and colleagues are the most common program improvement planning strategies that we've seen so far. So thank you so much for sharing. This is really helpful footing for us to be on as we dive in to using data for program improvement, which is our, our focus for the rest of today. So I am gonna go ahead and turn it over to Melissa to talk about how her program has used data for, pro has used data for program improvement in Des Moines. So Melissa, you can take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? I hope, I just wanna make sure. Yep, sounds good to me. Okay, great. Um, first, I want to say thank you for all the Ross coordinators that are on the phone for um, or on this webinar for everything that you do each and every day uh, to support, empower, and foster growth. I I really say this from the heart: you are true warriors uh, serving your participants. Um, I'm going to talk about what are the benefits of the Ross uh, data dashboard. Um, by using visual context, um, it offers a direct interpretation of the information and makes it easier to understand patterns, trends, outcomes, and performance. Really, when you look at this dashboard, there is an um, incredible amount of data in there. Um, and so, in some regards, it helps me to take a quick look um, at what I've done, I guess, um, as a whole versus me inputting my service activities on a daily basis. So it's, it, it's very helpful in that sense. Um, it has the ability to enable the coordinator to assess and evaluate services over time and allows um, the potential to compare data with other, over time with other grantees and hopefully will aid um, in the continuous improvement process of the Ross program uh, for coordinators. I wanted to kind of share a few points about the system I work in um, to give you a better understanding of the framework. Uh, first, I utilize family metrics software um, to record and submit data to HUD. Also, other supportive service programs that coincide with the Ross program are the FSS program, also, we have an elderly disabled service coordinator funded through capital operating funds. So we have three programs coinciding together, which will impact things. Um, lastly, I consider the City of Des Moines Municipal Housing Agency to be a, a small agency. I know listening in past webinars, um, I haven't analyzed everything, but I've heard some housing authorities that really have large scale. So I'm going to consider myself small. Um, first, we're going to dive in a little bit just on a general overview. And I want to focus on just one year. And um, everyone can see that. And it's pretty self-explanatory. But just to let you know, for 2020 or grant year three, I had 72 participants and 176 non-participants. So I have about 30% enrolled. I'd like to get more people enrolled. Um, I, there's been challenges with that, but I think opportunities to reframe it, which I'll talk about uh, later for engagement. Um, I would say my observation is uh, since being in this position, the more requirements, I'll, I'll kind of lay that system, the more requirements that are asked to enroll, um, the less I think overall participants want to, um, but also I think usually the enrollment is centered around the relationship, building a relationship for me 
or seeking a service. I don't have an incentive like an escrow, um, like FSS. So it's usually people soliciting that, or I try to do welcome visits with um, every resident that moves in. Um, and so um, that's usually my initial contact where I'm starting to build that relationship. As you can see, I serve a pretty even people who have disabilities as well as workable adults. Um, and you'll see um, the, on the right, it just shows services. So uh, pretty often if one person seeks a service, you're seeing the data in 2020 that shows others uh, seeking more than one service. Nate, I don't know if that can go down. The next slide. Um, achievements during this period, um, you're not, education. I, I had one person graduate, um, very, proud, just so excited for her. Um, she got her nursing degree. Um, she then joined FSS. Um, as you know, uh, Ross can be a transitional program for FSS. Um, and she actually joined FSS, the timing was perfect, um, before she got her first job. I actually helped her develop her resume, um, worked on that, um, and so she transitioned to FSS before I could count that employment. But it's a wonderful opportunity for her to enroll in FSS because of that timing to um, build that escrow. And when you look over historically at asset building um, strategies, um, the escrow is just so significant um, for moving that pendulum. Um, enrolled in educational programs, I'm gonna tell you historically, since I've been in this position, um, post-secondary, I do not have very many. Um, and part of that, it may be FSS. A lot of clients in public housing that are in post-secondary, the ones that are, are actively participating in FSS. Um, where I'd like to see um, an increase, which I'll talk about later, is um, in um, cert certificates like job training, short-term job training certificates or vocational programs. On the right-hand side, I, you can see that pretty well. Um, just uh, case management. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one, and I'll talk about that later. Um, and uh, employment services, um, I want to see that improve. And, um, you know, looking at the data, it kind of um, helps you to look at what, especially with the HUD focus areas in 2020, where I need to put my energy on besides um, like developing some additional strategies and framework. Uh, financial services, I'll talk about later. Um, that's really kind of taken a, uh, I used to provide financial education on site um, with COVID. I would say at our housing agency, a lot of the clients I serve do not have internet access and um, digital skills. Now with um, the pandemic, the bright side is hopefully there's gonna be a lot more um, opportunity down the road, especially with the EBB, and I think different programs and funding will occur to break that digital divide um, so that we can work on digital literacy, um, because that is one thing um, that has been brought out in this pandemic um, as a priority. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, challenges and opportunities um, of the Ross program. Um, I want to first talk about levels of engagement um, so that you kind of understand my framework. Um, given that we're a small housing agency, a lot of my interactions are one-on-one -on -one with clients. Um, that's how I'm providing service activities. We do have groups or programs. Um, prior to the pandemic, we held workshops. Um, you know, on a regular basis, various workshops, um, like many of you included, uh, digital literacy, health and nutrition. Um, I've had some great partnerships, um, which I'll talk about later, um, for bringing that on site to remove that barrier and hopefully increase some motivation um, to attend those workshops. Um, events, I know in past um, webinars, I've heard some fascinating um, how um, some of the housing authorities have done tremendous events. I would not say that's the norm for us, 
Um, I, I would like to hold some, you know, in the future, we have done a health and wellness where all the supportive service programs were on board um, to solicit donations to increase, um, you know, incentives to get them there. And when we've done that, um, they've turned out very well. Uh, challenges and opportunities of the Ross program. I bring that up because, you know, that, that does uh, have a correlation with, um, uh, you know, just service activities. I think everything is fluid and ever changing. So as a service or as a, a Ross coordinator, that's just inevitable. Uh, things change just like COVID. Uh, we change how we serve clients um, and what their needs are. Um, it's ever changing. And so what we do and what we provide is different. Um, I think resident engagement has been challenging at times. Um, so I will bring out some of the challenges, but with every challenge, there's an opportunity. Um, so resident engagement, I think it sometimes can be correlated on stability, how stable they are um, for um, just continuous engagement, regular engagement, um, as well as priorities and shift. I mean, um, even when you are stable, your priorities and um, focuses change depending on the circumstances you're provided with. We are, um, our goal is to assist with removing barriers through information and referrals to service. Um, information and education equals empowerment. So I, this will be a repeated conversation I have with many clients. My goal or my role is to provide you information and education so that the more knowledge you have, the better you can make decisions for yourself if they're not aware of something. And oftentimes when they have more information or are more knowledgeable, I would say in most cases, um, they are empowered and can make a better decision for themselves and their family. I think the timing of information and education must be relevant to the participants. Um, so it's really where's their focus, where's their energy, and where are their priorities? What goals are they focusing on? And that's a good time to um, bring out pertinent information. As Trey said, I'll just use the example financial account. Um, is there something motivating, um, like a natural, I'm going to start a job soon, or um, the economic stimulus packets? It's a good time to educate. I know we've had a lot of webinars from CFB and they bring that up a lot in their financial education that it just has to be relevant and timing to really have a behavior change or an outcome, a change. Um, so I, I do think that holds suit for a lot of things. And then our goal is to give participants tools to put in their toolkit. Um, levels of engagement I already covered. So we'll move on there um, to the next slide. And services over time. Um, I have to tell you, when I get into this data dashboard, there really is a lot of data and, and I need to be able to spend more time in it. So um, I, I looked at mine, um, but I still really need to look and think through things. I'm gonna kind of highlight, I do, what I like about this dashboard um, is you see, you can see your services from time to time and how they changed. And there may be logical um, explanations or may, maybe curiosity. Oftentimes, as I said, when um, we're in the forest, we can't see the trees. So when we're doing this and serving clients all, all day, what we think we're doing may not, or where we're spending the majority of our time may not always be accurate. So this is a good way to look at that data visually, and I tend to be a more visual person, so it, it's, it's helpful to me than looking through a report. Um, I'm gonna kind of touch on a couple, even focusing on, on one year. Um, what I do like about this data dashboard, and I'm gonna say even moving forward um, with the 2020 grant and future uploads, is the ability to look at the population focus and the area of need. And I'll come back to that at the very end for um, some of my ideas and my plans of actions for um, doing a better job or improving, potentially improving my program through reaching out to a fellow Roth colleague. Um, case management, as I mentioned, a lot of mine is one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, so I'm, I'm kind of not surprised. That's where he spent a lot is, um, especially during the pandemic. Um, when I was in the office, I still had to reach out to my clients, but I could have a lineup of participants and not participants seeking a service. Um, I was very accessible. My office is on the main floor across from the elevators and a 200 high rise public housing unit. So I, I'm very accessible. I'll leave it at that. Um, and so when the COVID hit, um, it surprised me because everybody had a relationship, my participants, how I did, I mean, I did get some calls, but not very many. So I had to be intentional to reach out to them. And I do that, you know, re regularly and check in with them. Um, as you know, with most coordinators, sometimes we have phone numbers change. Um, or the minutes are out. Um, so um, I remember one month I tried just, it sticks out in my mind. I couldn't um, get through to 10 people, um, even get a working number. Um, so we're always looking for different techniques um, to communicate like text, um, trade brought up. That's an area I wanna look up is apps like Remind, um, because I think that might be an effective tool for um, sending out reminders about special things like EITC or VITA sites, just to give an example. So that's something I wanna put on my radar. Education, not at all surprised by um, education, that it's really, when I look at post-secondary, I don't have a lot of clients um, and that's okay because they're in FSS usually if they're going to participate. Um, what I'd like to see though, and I'll talk about in the education area. So um, is working on those career pathways, um, working on livable wages through uh, promoting uh, short-term trainings, apprenticeships. Um, and the reality is college is not for everyone. It's finding the right fit for you and there's various career pathways. Um, employment services in 2020, I had an increase. And I can honestly say that was probably because I have been more intentional and focused on focusing on that, not only with the clients that say they want jobs, but more on actions or things I do um, to assist the client on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so we talked about that financial literacy and health and wellness. Um, I can tell you, I have two rock star partners um, the financial, um, historically, I, um, with financial education, it's a hard thing um, in Ross to get people to participate in. I encourage it. Um, I have one, as I said, one rock star partner, um, Carolyn Stuckelberg through, through Iowa State University, who prior to the pandemic came every three months and offered a workshop. She may only have one or two, and that was usually my participants. If I'm calling, I'm saying, come on down. Um, but that's how I got financial education um, into uh, Ross program participants by strongly encouraging that. That was probably my most effective strategy. And in regards to health and wellness, I also have a very good partnership with Iowa State University Extension and Mary um, Crisco, who's our nutrition specialist, has consistently come um, to on site to the public housing unit and provided regular per, um, presentation on various nutrition. And she brings food. Um, so prior to the pandemic, we had a pretty good um, you know, response from that. So during the pandemic, I could see where that, that has gone down in those areas. Um, and I'm going to stay in some areas quick to highlight, like in health and wellness. When I look at overall performance and maybe uh, numbers going down, that doesn't mean it's a negative. In fact, it can be a positive. So when I look at health and wellness, um, I think, okay, if, if a percentage is going down, is that really a bad thing? When clients enroll in my program, we always talk about, do you have... Um, you know, uh, doctor established, do you have this? And then I'll educate on preventative. 
and try to work with them to get those preventative services and set that pace for, have you had your, um, went to the dentist? Have you had an annual visual exam? So over time, if you're working with those clients, you may see a decrease um, in re, uh, service activity there. I would say that's not necessarily a bad idea or a bad thing. It's a really a good thing. Um, and I'm gonna just go on to kind of the grantee comparison. If we can go to that slide, as you can see my areas of uh, low and high, um, what I can tell you, I mean, I think it's helpful. As I said, education there, you know, looking at this, it kind of helps me to hone in and focus. I'm surprised by some things, but I'm not surprised by others. Um, in the area of employment, I know I have uh, work to do. Besides serving the clients, I need to look on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I need to look at what am I doing or what can I be doing differently? And um, in the employment area, I'm looking at developing a toolkit or my goal is to develop a toolkit because in the city of Des Moines, there's a lot of resources but they're very hard to get at. And when I work with clients, a lot of times no one has um, spent time with them on giving them career guidance on developing a plan. Have you done an interest inventory? Do you know what career pathways are to determine what's the best fit? Um, doing that exploration, that guidance, um, giving the resources for who sits for job search and assistance, as well as resources on all the um, employment or training opportunities, which organizations do that and how do you reach them? So that's one of my goals, as well as health and wellness, trying to develop a toolkit. We have managed care organizations now and they offer kind of additional incentives if you do the preventative care. So um, working with those MCOs to um, kind of aggregate a toolkit that I can either take out one piece or more than one. And also I find with health and wellness, a lot of clients don't have, know what questions to ask when they go to a provider. And I know with my insurance, it's Blue Cross, they sent me home, here's questions you ask when you go to the doctor. What's the treatment plan? What's this? Um, so oftentimes I will have that dialogue and print up that information. So my goal is to um, hopefully increase some outcomes and that's more on not what I, looking at that and making a plan, creating that, a plan for continuous improvement. Um, and so the other thing I like on this, which I going forward is the um, cohorts and the focus areas. So as I had told Nate, Nate when I had my one-on-one -on -one session, here's what I'm gonna wanna know. I feel that I learned best, not only from the clients I serve, but from, from fellow Ross colleagues. Um, and so I wanna be able to look at those HUD focus areas um, and uh, see, find out who those colleagues are and who's performing well. And I wanna be able to reach out to them and find out what they're doing. So in the last couple of months, which I wanna give a shout out to Dan Farrell and Ramona Rodriguez, I reached out to them and just found out more about uh, who do they serve, how do they, um, enroll, kind of what are their strategies or what are their processes if someone's not engaging. Um, and it's very insightful. So moving forward, I think I'm very optimistic about that. Um, it's reaching out to clients um, or to fellow colleagues and finding out those ones that are performing well in those focus areas and cohorts, um, having those conversations, um, especially um, when comparing um, grantees, I want to know if they're similar to mine. Are they rural or urban? What are their demographics? What is the size of population they serve? You know, is it a small housing agency or a large? And um, I talked about focused areas and cohort. So, um, so I'm excited about that. I think that will help me. There's areas of improvement. Um, you know, it's a continuous uh, process for improvement and um, it's always fluid. Um, so I'm, that's where I look for the data dashboard to um, help and assist me to better serve my clients. So thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thanks. We really appreciate that.
Um, I think we'll hold questions until the end in the interest of time. So I will turn it over now to Victoria to talk about using data for program improvement in Oakland. Victoria, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Nathan. Um, before I get into what you're looking at right now as my co-presenter, Melissa, just gave to you, I want to just talk a little bit about who I am, how long I've been doing Ross, and some of the activities I have seen between what I have done previously and what I'm doing now. I've been with the Ross program now six years, and I started out with the Ross program doing the logic model. By a show of hands, raise your hand to let me know if you know about the logic model and, and if you've used the logic model. Right? I got you. You can't see what you did. And that's what I'm going to, to talk with you about. What you can't see and how you can make the changes. I know that I made you smile for a few moments there. Currently at the Oakland Housing Authority in, this, in California, we have just recently started using a, uh, well, in the past two years where this is our second year in using the dashboard. And I wanted to give you an idea just briefly about some of the numbers that are on here, what you may see, as I'm sure many of you have already had an experience with using the data dashboard. Again, it does provide you some information. It shows you about what you're comparing, what you're doing, what activities you're doing. And we all know we have chosen different areas from our grants to pursue for supporting our residents. In this particular area, yes, you will see that during this time period between 10, 2018 to September the 30th of 2020, we had 111 participants. And you see the categories in which we chose were elderly, people with, di with disabilities, work able adults, and then we also had other areas for financial literacy and education. Nathan, you can go to the next slide, thank you. And also some, some of the information that you, you will see on the dashboard, if for our area of housing, we have opportunities to see the achievement areas during those periods. You know, part of this where we have individuals who are going back to school, some of them were also enrolling to maybe doing a post degree, you know, and or considering getting their GEDs because we all know our residents. I'm hoping you know your residents and I'm gonna talk more about that as we go along. However, your dashboard is really crucial to your outcomes. As it's been stated before, these are the measurements in which we know and we find out how we're engaging with our residents, how we're supporting our residents, and again, what is it that you can't see so that you can bring it to the residents. Nathan, you can move to the next slide. Thank you. Again, on my services and our population, the Oakland Housing Authority has a vast of a population. We serve approximately six different communities, all within the radius of all of our housing units. So with this, even though the case management shows that our average services for each participant that is enrolled in the Ross program, we at least target them at least nearly twice, providing them with some type of service as an adult. We also provide services for those that are seniors and or non-seniors that have a disability as well as our elders that we try to take care of and make sure that they have everything they need. There's a couple of things I want you to pay attention to on this particular side, slide. So on your left-hand side, it says case management. The darker line references that on that line, we actually provided them more times with those services. So when you look at your dashboard, you will look and see the levels of colors on your dashboard, which will reflect exactly how many times you have been engaged with them. And then as it gets lighter, it shows also how many other times you've participated with them in the other service areas that your particular agency decided to choose for your targeted areas for your grant. This information is really key because it will bring you back to what is it that we might need to do. Again, the pondering of the question is, what is it that you can't see? 
All righty. So again, because we as the Oakland Housing Authority, our targeted points were education, educa elderly and disabled, employment, financial literacy, and health and wellness. We focused on those areas and thinking about how we can increase these numbers, just as my counterpart just referenced, what is it that I can look at my dashboard to see what is it that I can change? When we used the logic model, it was simple for all of us. Would you not agree? It was really simple because HUD provided our, our metrics for us to reach for. Whereas with the dashboard, we're now having our comparison numbers on what we're doing in our communities while servicing our residents in the Ross program. The main goal for all of us is identifying what else is there to do. Or am I able to see the lack of services by looking at my dashboard? And I would agree with you, yes, we do have the ability to look at the dashboard to see where we might be missing the mark and again, as was mentioned previously, what is the creativity that I might be able to come up with in order to make sure that I meet the targets and meet the metrics in my grant? Nathan, you can go over to the next slide, please. So there's a couple of things also on here, which when I saw the outcomes over time, this metric here, this um, particular slide here, will show you that we started out, and this is the beginning of 2017, when we were actually using the logic model. So in comparison to using the time period for 2017 up until when we received the new grant, which we're in our second grant, which is now we're finalizing our third year of our second grant, these are the comparison numbers that shows me, okay, my first year of the logic model, this is where I really increased my numbers based upon the green area that's on the PowerPoint on the presentation slide. In the gray area, it shows that I really didn't make any much make much change. And then moving over to the latter of my dashboard, I'm looking at did anything increase for the access to care for the seniors? Did anything increase for the employment status for that term period? It increased by 4%. And how much of it maintained the same? Did it mean that I didn't really pursue those services for the elderly and or for employment opportunities? Or was I just focusing on something else? And then the gray area just lets you know that there was no major change in what the services were that you provided. Again, looking at the dashboard, what is it that you can't see? because that gives you an, a direction on what do I need to focus on in my community. Your community might just be maybe of one group. Your community might be made of multiple groups. However, when you're planning your outcomes and you're doing your work for program improvement, are you considering all of the areas that you want to target in your community? That is my question to you. Can we go over to the next slide there, Nathan? At this time, I would like for you to answer these questions for me because we may have used the logic model before. However, we are using the grant solutions database now. So if you can take a few moments to answer the questions that's right before you, I would really appreciate that. So if you haven't answered, just, you know, put your check either one and participate so that we can see what you all are doing out there. Great, Nathan, can you maybe provide us with any responses? Do we still have any time for any responses? I can. So we see it looks like 40 people said that they use a system other than grant solutions. So that would be the uh, the total group of people that would be answering B or C. So then among those 40 people, it appears that 14 of them said that they found that using another system helps with planning strategy, and 13 have said that using another system improves program outcomes. It's like 40 people using a system other than grant solutions, about 14 of them finding that it improves either planning strategy or outcomes. 
Okay, it will be interesting to see what the 94 indicated as far as what they're using for their reporting methods for program improvements. But that's good to know. That's really good to know. So what I want to talk with you also is about all of the coordinators, I'm sure, if you were not passionate about what you're doing right now, you would not be on this webinar. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do at the Oakland Housing Authority and the system that we're using to do our data gathering. Nathan, can you go to the next slide, please? Many of you may already know about TAG. It's tracking at a glance. We at the Oakland Authority, we're currently using that system right now. TAG is a web-based case management and performance tracking tool. Everything that you're pursuing as far as your grant measurements and the areas in which you chose for your grant, you have the ability to target those areas into the TAG system and it will be able to provide you a report. It has multiple reporting tools that you that's used to analyze your outcomes. It tracks the services and activities established by HUD, by what you set the program up for. It also helps you to manage caseload from recruitment through program completion. And we know that the program completion is once we get the participants enrolled that we will be able to see by pulling up our, ta our TAG report and our data for each participant enrolled, we will be able to see exactly where they are and what do we need to communicate with them. Because the key will always be that no matter how many participants we have, engagement will always be the key for finding out how to meet the needs of the participants and meeting your, your targets. Next slide there, Nathan. Absolutely, and I'll just note that we have about 10 minutes left. Okay, thank you so much. Even though that this is our first year with using TAG, in preparing our data, it helps us in preparing the data for the grant solutions. And we use it because it helps us to get an early on measurement because we're able to run this report at least every quarter to see where we are with fulfilling all the targeted areas for those areas that we chose for the grant itself. It also helps me to identify the needs for the residents. And then again, it helps me to meet the target points. And then it also helps me to identify the available resources for improvements. This is where I came up with the strategy and the creativity, which we all have to use because during the COVID period, things were different. We were caught off guard. We like to say we were caught off of our square because we didn't know what to do and how to come up with it. So in strategizing what would be the best fit for our residents, we came up with the creativity of using Zoom. We came up with using Zoom and we came up with the project of Zoom on the move. This is where you're using your collaborations to help you to meet those targets that we were able to streamline during the COVID period. We have currently right now, because of our six year collaborations with many community organizations, we have 14 to 16 agencies that come on every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, bringing all of the resources, all of the targeted areas that we have wrote for our grant directly to Zoom on the move. It was mentioned earlier that once one person gets on Zoom on the move and they find out about asthma, they find out about the cooking class, they find out about the winning Wednesday for job employment sessions, they find out about our community resources and what's going on, they find out about the seniors get Tai Chi, I'm still learning it, but the seniors get their Tai Chi classes, so that still helps the health and wellness piece, financial literacy, we have our job employment, we have have our education people coming on and we even made it to where as during the COVID period we know that it's been tough times in the household somebody might have needed to have to have counseling so that they in order for them to get counseling we brought one of the organizations in to support them through the counseling all of this is brought through the zoom on the move it targets every area that is needed and we have our numbers because of the participation and again, the referrals, 
and then the outcomes for them reaching and participating. Because again, as a coordinator, we want all of our participants to be successful. We want them to become self-sufficient. So even with us having financial literacy, we partner with US Bank. They're doing credit workshops, financial literacy, and we even have our home ownership on there as well. So thinking outside of the box because of what I couldn't see, I brought it to the Zoom on the move. Again, what is it that you can't see? Nathan, can you go to the next slide, please? So again, thinking about the projects that we have on the dashboard allowed us to look at the projects that were needed, the lessons that were needed to be learned. And these were part of the things that we considered in our planning and implementation. So ask yourself and make a note right there, right where you are. What is the difference about your population? Who are you targeting? targeting? How would you best serve the target group? Thinking out box, outside of the box, as well as being cre creative. Does the data that you just looked at really help you to meet the targets? How to use your participating processes and tools? Remember, if you look at your dashboard, if your processes are a little bit different, like we even brought in our West, we brought in our health community center because now instead of our seniors having to go directly to the office to renew Medi-Cal, they now do that on Zoom on the move appointments. Access the information and access your resources. They're right there for you. Take advantage and really think outside of your box. This will really help you with strategizing on your numbers may be low right now, yes, and that's because of COVID and maybe any other circumstances. But sit down a moment and think about how I can be creative to bring everybody in. And like it was referenced early and it was indicated, don't forget to use the neighbor that's in the neighborhood. The one that you know is always engaging and you plant that seed in them about what's going on and you can always make sure that all the activities like our, uh, our Zoom on the move, we're, we're getting ready for family feud, the community is building up their groups to participate. So that's, fam that's neighborhood communication. Everybody will learn at, because then we have the opportunity to introduce Zoom on the move to those that are not familiar with it and all the activities because everyone is sitting at home. So give them something to do straight from the sofa. All right, next slide there. So of the overview of the continuum of services are these main frameworks. All righty. Again, planning and accessing your resident engagement. Who in the community is really active? Use them to do your outreach and be the spokesperson for you and your participating program. Involvement and assessment. If you have a relationship with a few of your residents, let them be the ones to talk to others and then you find out what the needs of the residents are. What are they searching for? That also brings your numbers and enrollment up because then you can let them know, hey, well, this person is needing that. So bring in the organization that can also provide that service. And then if it's within your range of your grant, then you've got a win-win there. And then remember that the three levels of engagement are always size, target group, and program priority. And that's where you reach out to the other organizations to bring them in because it meets the needs of everybody's in your community that you're serving. Inclusion in decision-making. Sometimes it's good to just listen to your residents when they're enrolling. You can learn a lot from them because then that way you can always find a way to bring an extra service, which I'm sure might be on any one of your grant choices to be able to meet that target because that's what the community is seeking. Sometimes we have to step back and allow our residents to tell us what the needs are. And that's really key for us. So I hope that you wrote that down. Additionally, there's always a key factor that we have to consider, the five characteristics of empowerment for our residents. That's the self-confidence that they have, that they can make it. The personal control, 
If you give your participants a challenge, something that they can manage within 60 days and accomplish, you've got them excited. Now they're willing to continue on and meet every target area for their goals and for your targets, because you can then direct them to any one of your target areas for participation. And then you also have meaningfulness because that is important for them to continue on in the Ross program. And then you will see them on a regular basis as well as they will do your outreach for referrals. And lastly, task impact. This task will always take them towards success. So, and then the thing also is capacity of advocate. You will always serve as their advocate. You serve as their liaison. When you indicate and you communicate with your participants, you will then be able to serve between them and the organization that you bring in to be able to meet the needs again. Because what one person may not be aware of is available to them, another might speak and it might give you that aha moment. And with that, that will always help you to change the numbers on your dashboard, change your numbers on the other systems that you're using, as well as change the numbers in my tag system. All righty. So I hope that I've given you something to think about, about thinking outside of the box, about different ways to do your outreach, also about using your residents for your marketing tool, because you're all passionate about what you do. So take that passion and take it a step further. And then that way you will see the success of what you're doing, the success of your grant, and then the success of all of your participants. I hope I've provided something to you this afternoon and or this morning that you can walk away with something and think about and say, I think I could do it this way. And I think now I don't have to worry about what I can't see because now I can see it. I thank you all for allowing me to present. And then now let's get the games, be let the games begin. What can we do to change the outcomes of success? Review your outcomes for each level and category. Choose activities that draws on the interest of the resident participants. How can we recruit more resident engagement? Use your Ross for positive increases in resident net worth. And the journey is important as the destination of what we're trying to achieve. I thank you all for allowing me again, and you all have a great day. Thank you so much, Victoria. That's great. I think we will turn it over now to questions. If you have submitted a question using the WebEx Q&A already, uh, we can answer those. And if you have a question but haven't submitted it yet, please go ahead and do so. I'll put up the reminder on how to do that. Jennifer, do we have any questions in the queue right now? Uh, we have a couple questions. One was uh, regarding how, you know, looking, examining the data and um, asking how elderly is defined, and that's defined as 65 or older. We also have, have a new question on how are guests able to fund their programs? Um, can you help clarify what you mean by guests? The speakers, Melissa, Victoria. How are you able to fund your programs? This is Victoria. One of the ways I'm able to maybe extend other programs outside of our grant, our Ross grant, because we have the ability to be effective and we've got a six year history with all of our organizations and most all of the events that we have held, we have some organizations that will have excess funding with their programming areas. And as we all know, everybody has to use all of their funding by at least June the 30th. So because we've had strong relationship with many of our collaborations um, in the community, they will contact us and then we will 
they will contact us to be able to see if they can bring their programming to our site and or our agency to be able to utilize the rest of it. And then that allows us to be creative in adding something else to the uh, Ross grant and services that we provide services and activities. So in your relationship with your organizations, they're the ones that be able that have funding. If you have a strong relationship and you've always been effective, they will bring fun additional funding over to you. I hope that answered your question. Melissa, do you want to take a stab at that question as well? Um, I, I think strong partnerships, I would say I haven't had any par partnerships that have providing funding per se, but more partnerships that have brought services on site, um, like through a partnership with uh, Hope Ministries, we're able to offer clothing vouchers to clients um, in my program, as well as I initiated a partnership with a food rescue program where we have food coming um, prior to the pandemic uh, three days a week. So I would say it's more harboring, you know, with those partnerships or finding new partnerships to bring those services on site um, has been where um, those additional services have occurred. So more kind of in, you know, through them as a mechanism. Great, thank you. And there, here's a question in about um, engagement. How have you helped calm the fears of your seniors? Our seniors basically wouldn't come out of their homes to participate and talk due to all the fear in relationship to COVID. This is Victoria. I could, I would like to respond to that. One of the things that I did was with the Zoom on the move, we created exercise classes. We created dance classes. And now that the seniors are coming out, they want to do a, just a chat shop which is on the Zoom, because they've had an opportunity to meet others who are in the home during the COVID period. They now have met many people, so they're now connecting with one another and they're chatting via Zoom. Again, being creative and listening to the seniors, we allowed them to come on to Zoom, do the via the, uh, the Tai Chi, <clears throat> the cooking classes and the dance classes. And then they, they indicated that we want now want to do a chat group. So we've connected all of them together to be able to communicate and then build relationships amongst themselves. Thank you, Victoria. And someone is asking if uh, you mind uh, if I share your email address to reach out after the meeting. For Victoria, no, that wouldn't be a problem whatsoever. Okay. Um, we have another question in. We only have a couple more minutes here. Someone is asking um, two more questions. One is asking, what is the best way to record on Grant Solutions all programs that are being provided for participants? I think the that probably needs to be a little bit more specific with that question, right? Yeah, and I wonder if it were, might re refer to in the Inform or ODLC tool. Right, are they asking like how to report on the services that they're doing? Recording great solutions offerings that are being provided for participants. So I would say uh, one, starting with the Ross data guide and finding out where uh, of the activities that you're doing or services that are being provided to residents, seeing which data element applies to them. Um, and I think the Ross data guide is a really good, um, a, a really good tool or guide to look at for that. If you're asking more specifically around what types of services, then feel free to uh, reach out in the Q&A. Thank you. And then lastly, I know we're right at the end here. Someone is asking, can data updates be more than once a year? That's a big question. Something we're working on, right, Trey? Yes, I will say if data updates are more than once a year, then quite possibly reports will be um, submitted more than once a year. Um, and I think a good majority of you will just submit reports, right? <laughs> more than once a year. 
or maybe not. Um, but it is something that we're looking into, and if it is more so an optional, um, optional for you guys to be able to do that, um, to submit data, you know, mid-year so that we could then upload it into the dashboard. Thank you. One more question came in asking, how do elderly participate using technology? Melissa or Victoria, would you like to take that question? Uh, yes, what we did, we started out with a digital literacy program and what we focused on was having a, a certain number of seniors come in. This was pre COVID. So we were able to train many of the seniors on how to create emails, how to do zoom. We gave them a step by step literature so that they will be able to follow. And then we will also have phone calls where that we can reach out to them and or they call us so that we can walk through them through any challenges that they may have um, to use the equipment. It was key for us to make sure that one, they had the email to get on the Zoom, and then two, to be able to be comfortable with logging on to Zoom with no problems. And so one of the things that we always do, we always tell all of our seniors to log, try to log on 10 minutes prior to whatever session is going on, just in case they have any difficulty, they have enough time to reach out so that they don't miss out because that engaging piece is really good for them. Thank you, Victoria, that's really helpful. So we are just about out of time for today, but I wanna thank you all again for calling in. Uh, after we leave you today, we really encourage you to look to your data for program improvement, just like we've heard about today. And remember that the 2020 reporting period is now available in the dashboard. So there is potentially some new data for you to take a look at. Hand in hand with that, we encourage you to work towards increasing your data quality. And to that end, the data quality quick reference guide has just been made available on HUD Exchange. So we encourage you to download a copy of that. And finally, you're welcome to review recordings of webinars one and two, which are available on HUD Exchange right now. We'll also be posting a recording from webinar three and today webinar four uh, shortly. So those will be available on HUD Exchange as well. We are also happy to share that one-on-one -on -one technical assistance is now open for scheduling once again. These sessions are a great chance to get one-on-one -on -one support for things like using the data dashboard, interpreting your data, and improving your data quality. So you can reserve a one-on-one -on -one session at ross-ta.ucanbook.me and uh, feel free to scroll forward in the calendar if you're not seeing any openings because sometimes we're scheduling a little bit farther out in the future. So thank you so much. I want to extend a huge thank you to all of our guest speakers for volunteering their time today. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for calling in. Take care.